Welcome to the Ambassadorial Series. I'm Jill Doherty. Probably no Americans have as unique and in-depth perspectives on Russia as United States ambassadors. They arrive at their posts in Moscow often with deep knowledge of the country and its language. They live in Russia. They meet and negotiate with the highest Russian officials. They travel throughout the country, interact with Russian citizens. They not only are eyewitnesses to Russia's history, but actors in that history. In the ambassadorial series, we hear from all the living U.S. ambassadors to modern Russia and to the Soviet Union before it. They recount their personal experiences in Moscow, the people they met, the challenges and even dangers they sometimes faced. And with the benefit of time to ponder these experiences, they tell us how they understand Russia, its relationship with the United States, and the impact that relationship has on the world. And what I saw on that afternoon, perhaps mid-afternoon, was first a sea of aluminum shields uh, moving uh, toward the American embassy and toward the Russian White House, which are opposite each other on the street, followed by the crowd from uh, the, in front of the foreign ministry. So I called the uh, embassy Marines and told them to get to the security officer and have the people who were residing in the embassy perimeter in the townhouses uh, to go to our underground uh, safe haven uh, underneath the center uh, of the embassy residence area because I was not sure, in fact, that we would not have uh, firing and indeed uh, other difficulties in that kind of confrontation uh, as this crowd, which was headed in that direction, met the NKVD or the, uh, the uh, then uh, KGB uh, paramilitary force surrounding the White House. As they advise their presidents on the best policies to follow, ambassadors often have to make difficult decisions. They are the ones who see a country's reality and its leaders up close. Ambassador Thomas Pickering was in the embassy and on the streets of Moscow during the 1993 standoff between the Russian parliament and Boris Yeltsin. And in the heat of armed conflict, it wasn't always clear who was right. Ambassador Thomas Pickering, you know, I think it was Time Magazine that called you the five-star general of the Diplomatic Corps, and that really is true with your enormous career. We're going to talk about Russia today, but, you know, you have served four decades in the Foreign Service for the United States, and I'm very, very interested in your perspective, that long-term perspective on Russia and the United States. But thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Jill, very much for that kind introduction. And even for diplomats, a little bit of hyperbola goes a long way. So I'm anxious to take your questions and look forward uh, to speaking with you. Well, let's return to uh, the time that you went to Russia as the ambassador, 1993. And uh, I remember 1993. I wasn't posted yet, but I went there a lot. And there was hunger. There were people standing in lines. Uh, politically, it was a very fraught time. You had the standoff that Yeltsin had with the parliament. You had the siege of the White House. Uh, you had more to come near that parliamentary election that apparently really uh, worried the Clinton administration and their support for shock therapy. So if you could take me back, what were you thinking as you watched all of that unfold? I arrived in Russia on May 22nd of 1993, and the great news was it was still snowing. <laughs> but the real news was that there was already engaged a standoff between the parliament and Yeltsin, and principally between people in the parliament who in one way or another either wished to replace Yeltsin or sought in somehow to maneuver him they were relatively, in what were the political terms of the day, more hardline, more communist, less reform-minded, uh, less pro-demise of communism. Uh, and many of them were, in effect, in the Russian White House, which was, at that period of time, the office of the prime minister. Uh, and some were high-up officials in the uh, in the Russian 
hierarchy. Uh, what I learned when I arrived and what I saw afterward, right through the October 3rd, uh, con uh, the October 3rd contention, indeed face-off, at the White House, was a pretty constant effort of the parliament elected essentially under communism, in which there were two party, two p candidates, an unusual approach by the communists, uh, for each position, but each one of them was in one way or another uh, part of the party, and many of them held their links with the party. Uh, and they made, by someone's count, over 300 changes in the Constitution, seeking in one way or another to promote themselves and to limit Yeltsin's powers. And this brought about both contention verbally, politically, and really, that went on for quite a bit of time. And I can recall that early in September, Andrei Kozirev, the foreign minister, maybe later in September, called in me together with my British, French, and German colleagues and said that Yeltsin has now decided to prorogue the parliament, in fact, to end them, uh, and that he will, in return, carry out an election in January of 1994 for a new parliament, and he intends to write a new constitution he can no longer operate in a situation in which the contention of powers is so great, the difficulties of rule are so hard, uh, and the differences so vast. Uh, and we obviously said there are dangers in dealing with the parliament that way. We understand what he's going through. We will report back to our governments, and we think it is important that if he does do away with the parliament, he needs to have a free and fair election to carry it forward. Uh, so this was an extremely interesting time, and it began a series of active events in which uh, began with the surrounding of the, the then parliament building, uh, the Russian White House, by uh, troops of the NKVD, their paramilitary organization. Uh, and that lasted uh, until roughly October 3rd, uh, and those events were well known, and perhaps you'd like to discuss them. Throughout this time period, uh, I was thinking, what are the alternatives? The return to a communist rule in Russia, and perhaps the effort to reconstruct the Soviet Union around a period in which, beginning in December of 1991, uh, the constituent republics had separated, become independent states, were recognized, uh, had become members of the United Nations, would be a throwback to reversion and recreation of a difficult situation, uh, which actually had failed in August of 1990, uh, when President then President Gorbachev in the Crimea uh, had a short-term right-wing revolt against him, and it failed. The alternative was to stay with Yeltsin. Uh, Yeltsin, in many ways, represented at least a reform element, uh, not someone whose governance uh, role was either steady, predictable, or necessarily uh, uh, conducive to where we thought Russia should go. But we thought Russia should go toward democracy, toward economic independence, uh, toward relationships with the world community, uh, and toward a different situation than the contention of the Cold War. Uh, these were all the ideas that I think were passing through our minds. There was no question at all uh, that some, at least, including some in my embassy, had concerns that the president was carrying out a coup against the parliament, quite rightly so, and that therefore he was, in fact, uh, uh, disobeying the Constitution and the best of democratic imperatives. If that were indeed the case, and there hadn't been all the changes to the Constitution, introduced by essentially the remnants of the Communist Party, I would have more have had more sympathy with their points of view. Uh, but their points of view uh, were expressed and sent to the State Department at their request in a dissent channel message. Uh, I offered, in fact, uh, to collaborate with them in a message where we could both state our views and put those before the broader uh, republic in the department, as far as I know, uh, whatever reply they received from uh, the dissent channel came after the confrontation at the White House, which was in many ways 
the final physical manifestation of the contention between Yeltsin and his parliament. I'm thinking of you at that moment. You were at physically at the embassy, I presume? Yes, on the events of October 3rd were interesting uh, because I had had a new grandson arrive and my wife had left for the United States, I think on Thursday or Friday for the birth of that child. Uh, and so I was alone. It was a Sunday. Uh, I was sitting in my study on the second floor of Spasso House but looking down a street uh, that, uh, in fact, gave me a way of seeing the garden ring, the second major ring uh, outside the Kremlin around the city of Moscow, on which the embassy is located. And the embassy was to my right and the foreign ministry to my left. And the foreign ministry had had a series of demonstrations for a week or two, in part in support of the, the, White, ha the White House, the non-Yeltsin crowd. And what I saw on that afternoon, perhaps mid-afternoon, was first a sea of aluminum shields uh, moving uh, toward the American embassy and toward the Russian White House, which are opposite each other on the street, followed by the crowd from uh, the, in front of the foreign ministry. So I called the uh, embassy Marines and told them to get to the security officer and have the people who were residing in the embassy perimeter in the townhouses uh, to go to our underground uh, safe haven uh, underneath the center uh, of the embassy residence area, because I was not sure, in fact, that we would not have uh, firing and indeed uh, other difficulties in that kind of confrontation uh, as this crowd, which was headed in that direction, met the NKVD or the, uh, the uh, then uh, KGB uh, paramilitary force surrounding the White House. A and indeed, that's what happened next. Uh, there was shooting. Uh, we found later a number of our uh, buildings had been penetrated by shots uh, coming from across the street, firing uh, at the crowd coming up uh, toward the White House by the people guarding the perimeter. They broke through the, the perimeter. People in the White House building were armed. Uh, they went next door and took control of a multi-story building, the mayor's office. In the meantime, uh, one of the Russian ar uh, uniforms, armed security guards outside the embassy was shot, and our people at the embassy arranged to have him transferred to medical aid. Uh, when it calmed, the next step was that this crowd that attacked those two buildings uh, loaded themselves into the military trucks they had captured uh, from the KGB paramilitary elements and headed to Ostankino in the north part of Moscow, the major television transmitter and the control for Russian national television. Uh, after they left, uh, I was in touch by phone and started watching on CNN these developments uh, and then resolved to go to the embassy. And so I walked through back streets and around back corners and underneath the garden ring and came into the embassy uh, and then spent the rest of my time in an office in the basement of the embassy, uh, which I had been using, uh, and uh, talking to the people, uh, calming our embassy people and seeking which direction and which uh, we and they might go to assure their shelter and safety, which was my primary responsibility. We were in touch with Washington, and obviously they were watching on television. It was interesting, as I didn't know until after. It was the same week as Black Hawk Down in Somalia, so we were not the only crisis Washington was dealing with at that moment. Mm. Extraordinarily uh, dramatic and also volatile situation. Um, in that situation, how did you even assess what was going on? I mean, I know you mentioned you were watching CNN's broadcast. And then how did you advise Washington? What did you tell Washington? Well, first, uh, I was extremely conscious of the fact that we were, in a way, locked in. Um, but I had a number of embassy officers in the political and economic sections who resided outside the embassy compound and who were able to set up a string of reporting arrangements to us by telephone, as well as we were hearing from other foreign embassies 
who were not in one way or another caught up in this ring. Uh, at the time, <clears throat> the <clears throat> crowd had left the Russian White House uh, and the <clears throat> defending forces had dispersed. So it was open, but it was dangerous. There were at least, we believe to have received uh, sniper shots from tall buildings on the Russian Arbat to the east of the embassy and a little bit south of it, but overlooking my residence. And so uh, I didn't want people in the embassy moving into that area in order to do reporting. Uh, so we depended upon uh, the hard work and the presence and the vigilance of the people who resided outside. And they began to provide us additional reporting. And I had an opportunity for a secure call with Strobe Talbot, who was watching things very, very quickly. And early on, Strobe's principal question to me was, uh, what should be our posture? And I said, we have no alternative. Uh, the alternative to President Yeltsin is so much worse that I don't believe we can do anything um, but reinforce and, and stick with him and, and do so in whatever way uh, you at the Washington end are seeing and hearing this, but we'll keep you up to date and informed in, in terms of what we are doing. Uh, and that was the situation uh, as the evening progressed. Uh, what happened at the uh, television station was an effort uh, to uh, use the military trucks to break through the front doors uh, of the facility at the, t at the bottom of the television tower uh, where the control arrangements were uh, managed. And that was defended by Russian police and military. There was a crowd in the square outside. Uh, there was an American photographer working for the New York Times who was wounded at the time. And he was in some ways covered by people around him who were seeking to avoid the shooting uh, that they had gotten caught in. And with their help, uh, he was transferred uh, to the Kremlin Clinic for treatment, uh, and they were very successful in treating him uh, there, but it was the first American I knew of who was caught up in the shooting. We had others uh, later to follow. Uh, and we were, uh, at the same time, uh, wondering about whether we should attempt to evacuate our people or not. Once it became clear there was so much shooting at Ostankino, our access to the major airport north of Moscow was blocked. I had no interest in trying to find buses and putting uh, several hundred people, including children, on buses, and so told my team that they would have to bed down uh, in a gymnasium that we had, which was below ground, uh, and stay there, and we would do everything we could to secure their safety and to defend uh, the compound and the people in it. Uh, there was never any attempt to take our compound and never any attempt to people to break in. Um, but at various times, including the next day, uh, we were in the line of fire of the continued shooting. And so overnight, we had an approach from the White House people, the rebels, who wanted our help in contacting the government. We uh, did what we could to do that without obviously taking any sides in the arrangement. We were talking to the government. Uh, but they were, put it this way, um, extremely preoccupied with what they were going to do, and they were not interested in advertising what they might do for obvious security reasons. So we knew very little until the early morning about what the reaction might be. And if you'd like, I would go ahead and continue to describe the next day. Please do. The next day, I woke up after having slept on the floor uh, in an office in the basement of the new embassy building, and I woke up to the sound of armored personnel carriers coming down a narrow alley uh, where the main entrance to the new embassy was located, and then watched on television as they deployed on a plaza in front of the Russian White House, and we saw armed soldiers uh, getting out of the armored personnel carriers and going into the front door of the Russian White House. Uh, in the meantime, later, uh, perhaps an hour or two, uh, we observed on Russian and U.S. television, CNN, uh, the approach of tanks uh, 
uh, from the direction uh, of west of Moscow on the main boulevard, Kutuzovsky Prospect. Uh, and uh, CNN had uh, a view from the fourth floor of a building that overlooked them. Uh, two of the tanks were seen to be loaded with what appeared to be ammunition from trucks. And then they moved slowly onto a bridge over the Moscow River where they had a clear shot at the Russian White House. Uh, they aimed their turrets and we could feel the ground shake with the shots that they put into the Russian White House. It appears as if they fired training ammunition of some type uh, because there were no detonations of shells, although the shells penetrated into the building and apparently lit fires. Uh, the external damage to the building uh, was not large as one might have expected with explosive rounds, uh, but they did this for some time clearly in order to drive the defenders of the White House out of it, uh, practically possibly because the invading troops were having trouble getting that done themselves. We later read in the newspaper that two or 300 people were there. They were armed. Uh, many of them uh, took refuge in the basement and got access to an extensive tunnel system that exists under Moscow uh, that for one reason or another can be used uh, to move from place to place underground. Uh, and so some were killed and some were wounded. I don't know that we ever had an exact toll, uh, but the building was recovered uh, and the fires that were lit burned out uh, by the afternoon or so, but it was a mess. Uh, and we were, of course, across the street. Uh, at one time on that morning, it was a Monday, I had a need to get more people reporting to us from outside, and uh, two or three, one of whom was Masha Yovanovitch, accompanied me in my armored Cadillac, such as it was, out of the embassy and over to the embassy residence. We had a portico so we could hide under that to escape any sniper fire, uh, and they used my residence as a kind of base uh, to organize uh, continued reporting of what was going on. Uh, during the time the tanks were firing, we saw on television large numbers, thousands of Russians uh, on the streets and indeed some on the bridge, uh, even as the tanks were firing at the building, uh, watching what was going on. I uh, had a sense in that whole process that uh, Yeltsin was determined to retake the White House to assert his authority and by the end of the day, that, without question, is what happened. Uh, I gave interviews at, uh, um, at the request of the journalist community uh, off and on during that day. Some uh, was available to move to uh, places around the city where they wanted to do the interviews on television, and some were done on telephone and so on. And we stayed in regular touch with Washington as the events proceeded in uh, by Monday, Washington had made statements in support of Yeltsin and what was going on uh, at the Russian White House, and uh, the termination of that was pretty clearly by Tuesday morning, Yeltsin fully in control of Moscow. An amazing story. And, you know, it raises in my mind this conundrum about Yeltsin, which is he was depicted by many people, at least in the West, as a Democrat and you know, fighting against the communists. But you are really talking about the uh, devil's dilemma of Yeltsin, is that he did some things that could be construed, and some of your own people said that, as very undemocratic. I mean, standing back and looking at him you know, with this uh, separation from that period, how do you define him in your own mind? Uh, what, what was he? Was he a bridge from one to the other, or what exactly? I think in historical terms, he was obviously a transition. Uh, at the time, we looked at him as someone who had the leadership qualities and the staying power to deal with the issue, uh, that having inherited a system uh, which was not yet fully disintegrated from communism to something else, 
he had to contend with the hangover remnants, <clears throat> including the efforts to use constitutional amendments to try to take power. Uh, and so what we had was uh, a constitutional type coup going on in one part of town uh, while he was trying to resist it in another part of town. And so force and violence broke out on the third uh, to which he responded, uh, perhaps in some ways prodded by his decision uh, to send Parliament home. Uh, but the chain of events, in my view, uh, was clearly uh, not only in Yeltsin's favor, but what we had seen and heard from Yeltsin, despite the fact that he had resolved to dissolve the parliament, uh, was pretty much uh, along the lines of one preserving uh, a changed um, a regime in power on the one hand and resisting <clears throat> what we believe to be the resurgence of people who wanted to reestablish the Soviet Union and communism on the other side of the issue, and therefore it seemed to res respond to public sentiment. Uh, and in that regard, uh, I think probably it did. Uh, so it was a complex situation, and clearly one in which you didn't have overnight, uh, in the week following Christmas in 1991, the marching of the communists out in the public and everybody appearing the next day as full-fledged Democrats. Yeah. You know, as you look at, as I look at your career in Moscow, and then even before that, uh, going back the last year, I believe 1996, in Moscow was kind of the run-up to the expansion of NATO. And if you talk about another, you know, freighted issue, NATO expansion is it. Russia is still very angry about it. Here in the United States to this day, there is debate among uh, Russia experts and others as to whether it should have happened or shouldn't have. Uh, where do you come down on that issue of NATO expansion? Well, I think I'll come to that in a minute, but I just wanted to add one more thing on Yeltsin, because uh, after the events at the White House on October 3rd and 4th, uh, we followed closely what he did. And I think a reasonable case can be made with one exception then on major decisions involving defense of democracy, he came out on the right side. And the one exception was the war in Chechnya, where seemingly he was persuaded not only by the fact that the Chechens had adopted uh, guerrilla warfare tactics against the Russian Federation, but that he was declining so much in popularity that there were clearly arguments, at least the surface evidence is such, that in order to win the next election in 1996, he had to take back uh, by force uh, Chechnya. Uh, and so that, you know, led to another conflict, much more messy, much less clear. Uh, it was quite fascinating that uh, during a visit uh, in the midst of the Chechen, early stages of the Chechen conflict, um, I had the opportunity to host uh, Vice President Gore. And I remember riding in uh, in the car from the airport, and I gave him my advice that there were some who were already talking about the war against Chechnya as Abraham Lincoln's reaction to Fort Sumter. And I said the two were not parallel, and that in no case would it be, in my view, a good thing uh, to make that uh, comparison while he was in Russia in public. Uh, of course, my advice, advice was worth everything uh, it, it cost him. It was free, uh, and he felt fully free to ignore it and did. How ironic. <laughs> so let's go to NATO. Yes, please. Uh, I've been in Russia long enough when this issue came up uh, to be deeply concerned about what the Russian reaction would be. There was no question at all that uh, particularly those managing Russia in Washington wished always to hold out the hope to the Russians that expansion or no, 
at some point, they in their democratic progression and rejoining of the international community might wish to become part of NATO. Uh, much of that was a hope over reality. If there had been anything that had been demonized on a regular basis, equally with the United States under the Soviet Union, it had been NATO. NATO was seen as the manifestation of imperialism surrounding uh, the communist uh, central state, uh, the USSR. Uh, and few, if any, Russians uh, gained any thinkingly useful feeling that NATO was really a reaction from the Red Army's uh, long-standing presence in Eastern Europe and the use of Red Army occupation in the defeat of Germany, in effect, uh, to fundamentally and forcefully, in cases, communize Eastern Europe. And therefore, NATO was seen as an aggressive alliance, as portrayed by the Soviets and the USSR. And we, despite uh, significant efforts to try to look at that question in a different way and to portray it to Russian eyes in a different sense, uh, failed. So uh, the Russian public reaction and indeed the Russian policy reaction were not so far apart at that period of time, despite the fact that the West in the United States was widely popular in Russia and among many Russians because they thought there was a new opportunity to have freedom, uh, economic prosperity, uh, change, travel, all of the things that had been resisted. But somehow, NATO presence did not uh, occupy a, a positive niche in that series of explanations. And so once we began to get wind of the NATO enlargement uh, as a serious policy option, uh, certainly not in any way offset by the notion that we will keep a door open for you, Russia, uh, we wrote back uh, quite serious, quite uh, strong uh, telegrams to Washington, uh, say that they had to calculate the effect of NATO on the Russian policy. Uh, rarely, if ever, did we get answers. And interestingly enough, uh, Bill Burns, in his wonderful book produced last year, uh, was able to rescue one of these cables uh, from the archives and get it declassified so it is published for you there to see uh, both the thinking of the embassy and the arguments that we make. Could we have done it differently? And I say, yes, quite, quite, quite probably. Uh, as the NATO question and enlargement expanded, and particularly related to Poland and uh, indeed uh, to other states uh, where there were significant ethnic presences in the United States, and thus they had some electoral significance, uh, we saw the beginnings of a different idea, but it in effect followed NATO enlargement rather than preceding it. And it was a thought attributed to General Shalikashvili, who was the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that we should set up a partnership for peace uh, and bring in uh, people who might at one day or another be headed toward NATO, but not necessarily limited, and that it should be what would clearly be a lighter touch in terms of how things would work, uh, but it could follow. Uh, and that was something that I thought could have preceded NATO enlargement, uh, been a kind of stepping stone. Not everybody who was in it would necessarily be considered for NATO membership at the same time, but it might have, particularly given the fact that there was Russian presence in it, and we were beginning, for example, peacekeeping exercises jointly in Russia and outside of Russia with Russian military forces at that time, uh, be able perhaps to palliate a little bit of the in-your-face nature of how the Russians viewed the NATO enlargement. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, the Russians had their own theory and, and, and ideas. Uh, they felt that they had been promised at the time uh, that Germany was reunited, uh, that NATO would not be extended. Uh, they clearly felt they had been promised there would be no stationing uh, of Western uh, nuclear weapons, principally U.S., east of uh, the then West German, uh, East German borderline, 
uh, as a kind of uh, nuclear joint commitment uh, that in one way or another was never a quid pro quo, but it paralleled the significant efforts we made with the Russians in which they were, in my view, highly cooperative uh, to recover Russian nuclear weapons stations in Belarus, in Ukraine, and in Kazakhstan, uh, something that took place and something that gave rise to the joint commitment that we would seek to defend Ukraine uh, as an offset to their giving up uh, the control they had over nuclear weapons, uh, and which was later obviously a centerpiece of concern about Mr. Putin's moves in eastern Ukraine. You're bringing up the name Putin, and although you were not the ambassador when President Putin was the president, um, he, it, it almost begs that question because the of the, um, let's say, contrast between Yeltsin and Putin, I'd be interested in your views, looking at them as leaders and maybe even as men, because certainly you've followed up to this date what Putin is doing. And then also, um, you know, relations between the United States and Russia, this debate over, you know, the great man theory, whether it's really um, the uh, individual in the position of president who changes things or whether it's more systemic. So I guess I've asked you two questions, but the first one would be Yeltsin vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Putin and what kind of leaders they were. And are. Let me begin a little bit and tell you that I had the opportunity to meet with Putin uh, perhaps once when, because I paid off on visits to St. Petersburg and the mayor, uh, Subchak of St. Petersburg, uh, had acquired quite a reputation as a constitutional lawyer devoted to Thomas Jefferson leading the city, at least, into a more democratic way. And that Vladimir Putin uh, was a deputy mayor. And when Anatoly Subchak uh, was not there to receive me, I was received by uh, Vladimir Putin, at least on one occasion. And I found him on that occasion, that occasion very laconic, very tight-lipped, uh, willing to listen, uh, not seemingly very overly friendly, but not necessarily contentious or in any way uh, pushing back on what it was I had to say. Uh, my staff at the Consulate General uh, saw Putin through two different visions. Uh, one saw him as generally helpful, particularly to the business community, hardworking, uh, deeply engaged and approachable. Others, a fewer, uh, saw him as perhaps uh, quite deeply in bed with the business community, maybe to the point, obviously, of realizing gains, uh, defending them, and in some ways, responsible for some of the problems that the American and foreign business community uh, had in St. Petersburg. I never resolved the differences between them. I was certainly aware of both of them uh, and uh, analyzed Putin to the extent that it made any difference at that point in that context. So <clears throat> after that, I had opportunities to meet with him on a number of other occasions, particularly when he gained power. Uh, and saw him as someone who was highly confident uh, of his own capacities, uh, ready to make uh, decisions, uh, clearly engaged in the future of Russia. And I would say that my analysis of Mr. Putin has been now for some time that one needs to look at the question of his aspirations for the return of Russia to great power status on the one hand, and how it affects his own situation uh, as a survivor in the Russian political system on the other. And the two go hand in hand. And in one sense, his survival depended upon his ability to articulate and carry out nationalist policies uh, that in one way or another centered around the idea that Russia had been, always will be, and is now returning as a great power to the world scene. Uh, and secondly, that it was his leadership uh, that made that so and what was important in building it. And you can remember in his early days where he attempted to consolidate power uh, through the appointment of seven uh, governors general for the large regions of Russia to uh, 
Trump, if I could put it this way, uh, the independence of the elected governors of that time. He took away the elections from a number of them uh, and in some ways hounded a number of them uh, because in one way or another they were establishing separate mini economies uh, in their own provinces from which uh, they were clearly benefiting and under which the uh, major Russian economy was suffering. So uh, those are thoughts, at least. Uh, and Yeltsin, in many ways, was declining after 1996. I was around for uh, his open heart operation in which Dr. DeBakey uh, played a helpful auxiliary role, although he didn't do the operation. Uh, but Yeltsin was in those days declining. Yeltsin clearly had shown uh, more often than uh, any of us liked uh, the propensity to substitute uh, alcohol for uh, what would have uh, perhaps be called protocol. But in one way or another, uh, he was in that particular period of time declining. Uh, much of what uh, Putin tried to change uh, was his reaction to how Yeltsin, in one way or another, uh, through weaknesses that were not necessarily his, but of the system, uh, became creatures of uh, the large oligarchs who used the opportunity uh, to take over the Russian economy uh, to develop uh, control of television, Beresovsky, for example, and it therefore played an enormously important role in the politics of Russia in those times because television was the single most significant medium of communication. Uh, and uh, Putin later saw that dominance by outsiders of television was something that he would not want to have continue uh, under his leadership. So he tightened up things from his perspective. Uh, he went through... Uh, various manifestations of leadership changes. Uh, I think the Medvedev taking over the presidency experience uh, for what would have been otherwise Putin's third term, prohibited by the then Constitution, was not the experience he wanted to continue with, uh, and we now see that today. Uh, so Putin has, uh, despite ups and downs in popularity, consolidated control, seemingly remains in firm control, has change the Constitution so he will be clearly uh, able to stay in power until something like 2036. Uh, what happens after that and what might happen between now and then are hard to see. Uh, the Russian economy has not kept pace with what uh, Putin, I think, would like to have seen, uh, but he seems to have at least a one tone deaf ear on the economy and perhaps not as tuned in as he might be, and often, I suspect, may wonder why uh, the street protests, which have been a continuing phenomenon off and on at various times in Russia, uh, don't stop or he can't finally and fully stop them. In part, I think it's because of his failure uh, to understand and listen uh, to useful advice that he can get from a number of important people around him about how uh, to take Russia's enormous resources and turn them into something but a unicrop petroleum economy. I did want to pick up on one issue, which is the relations between the United States and Russia. And so many people have said they're never normal. This is not, this is, these are two countries that because of their history, their culture, et cetera, have not had what you would say, um, you know, normal relationships that we have with, let's say, any European country, etc. And I'm asking, Mr. Ambassador, why do you think that is? Why is it, can we have a constructive, um, organized approach and relationship with Russia? Or always are we always doomed to have some type of conflict? I think it's a great question. Um, and Many will recognize that the use of the Russian word normalna is designed to cover over uh, any possible discussion of any problems of health or indeed of economic difficulties in personal relationships. But put that aside, uh, we went through periods between us 
uh, in which contention, world events, uh, and ideological differences of great significance in one way or another tended to hover over the relationship and cloud it. What could perhaps turn to periods in the past were our relations normal when they began in the early 30s? Were they normal in the Second World War? And I would have to say a depression of consequence and world contention, and then the fascist uh, expansion uh, through 45 meant that was not normal. The immediate appearance of the Cold War within years meant that was not normal. We operated in an external environment, in some ways enhanced by our domestic political environments, of significant differences and contention. And I can remember very well uh, in what I would probably take back to 1954, uh, my first year as a graduate student, a student conference at West Point uh, in which they gathered people from across the country uh, to, in fact, uh, sit down with cadets and where almost every lecture, every presentation uh, was super hyped on the dangers of communist expansion. Much of what we are seeing from a certain element in our population now or a certain element in our political community now about China and what to do about it. So the collapse of communism was not normal in any sense of the word. And we operated in a situation where even the best of economic development experts did not have what one could call a perfectly easy, fluid, highly uh, able to implement idea. Uh, there's an old expression, Adam Michnik, a Polish economist, once said that going from communism, from capitalism to communism is like making fish soup out of a fishbowl. But the reverse, we do not know how to do. And there was much of that. There was also much resistance in Russia, obviously, because people had for 70 years uh, been in many ways uh, enthralled by the system that was going totally to change their lives and their position in the world. Uh, the piece that many people remember most in parts of Russia uh, is that for the period of the Yeltsin time, uh, the West was trying to steer Russia, uh, didn't do it very well, uh, that Russians were in many cases, in their view, overridden uh, by the political and foreign policy imperatives of the United States and the West. And it was only when Mr. Putin came back that they regained some independence about this. And it was only through his leadership, which attempted uh, to do a certain amount of reforming, both uh, in the military, which had been very, very badly disintegrated, uh, and uh, politically and in the international community uh, to bring back what they had thought was the promise of change as they went out of communism. Uh, so in, in a way, uh, the expectation in the future that we will have perfectly, quote, normal circumstances in a world of constant change is something of a deception and a snare. What we need to do is to be able carefully to evaluate where we are, understand that we're never going to have perfect alignment, uh, to seek out, as we did, uh, particularly in the Cold War middle period, uh, how to control those mutual dangers which are existential. Uh, with the U.S. and the Soviet Union, it was a mistake that would lead to nuclear conflict, which would destroy the planet. Uh, and that's not hyperbola, uh, and many of us see some of those conditions returning. Uh, with Russia today, it may well be uh, to put in place a new arms control regimen uh, to build the stability that we were trying to build in the Cold War, which has been torn up mainly by the Trump period, although Bush began it in doing away with the ABM Treaty. Uh, for what are clearly narrow national objectives, which in my view are not thought through and are clearly not part uh, 
of what I would call a significant strategy on the part of the United States. And without going into it in this interview, we have much the same problem with Russia. I'm sorry, with, with China as we have with Russia. Uh, and what is it that might make a difference there? And, uh, one of the things that might make a difference is together dealing with COVID rather than separately uh, spitting at each other on the question. Or even more importantly, as John Kerry has suggested recently, on climate change. So that's one way, I think, to take a look both at how to assess the current situation and what might be the new normal. And the new normal is not something in which we can cover over uh, the differences or hide them, in which really active diplomacy will be of, uh, of great significance. We're not going to uh, indeed solve that by military standoff, particularly if it allows us to get into an accidental conflict. <clears throat> Although each of us will respect each other more uh, for the military prowess that is out there and more realistically have to take it into account. So it is not something uh, where uh, dreams of perfection uh, are realizable, but it is something where deep, hard work, to, to borrow from George Shultz, tending the diplomatic garden intensively every day is part of what can happen, and neither of us have done that. We've adopted falling back on demonology or demonization uh, as a substitute for policy when <clears throat> there are plenty of things that we can work on together. You're talking about diplomacy, and do you have advice for future ambassadors to Russia? Yes, I, I, I do. I think the advice is, uh, it, it is complex, but it is basically, one, uh, develop as many as you can of context. Whether you find those sympathetic or not is irrelevant. Uh, you need to hear from a wide variety of Russians on a wide variety of views. Secondly, uh, make sure that Washington knows and understands your best judgments about what's going on. Thirdly, <coughs> look for opportunities. As an ambassador, you have a significant role to play in helping to formulate foreign policy. I always thought that what was best done to earn my pay was to make sure that Washington knew when things were not working, but never to tell Washington things were not working without trying to tell them how they could be repaired, uh, refigured, repurposed, redone. Uh, and that, in some way, is a strong coda uh, for an ambassador. But ambassadors also have to look at the question of how and in what way uh, can I bring about um, a resumption of a better relationship in a time of great difficulty. With Russia, much of that depends upon the leadership and how they can be influenced uh, to understand the need uh, to try to find a way to repair relations. Uh, and that's always much harder uh, if, in fact, uh, the uh, personality relationships between leaders has disintegrated or, or gone south um, without their uh, significant involvement in bringing about repairs, that won't happen. I think that the second period of President Obama, when we thought that uh, Medvedev, as the legal and indeed uh, constitutional president uh, of Russia, deserved uh, more serious treatment than President Putin, uh, was a serious mistake. Putin had become prime minister. He was number two on the ladder, but he was number one in the decision-making chain. Uh, and efforts on the part of the United States uh, to deal with that uh, in an entirely protocol RA way uh, sent the message that the U.S. was actually seeking to replace Putin with Medvedev and expected that to happen. Uh, and that was obviously uh, not the best approach uh, to President, now President Putin on the whole subject. I have one last question, and I'm thinking about the people who will be watching and listening to this interview and getting a lot out of it, and thinking of students, you know, students who maybe they're in college, maybe even late high school, uh, thinking about the Foreign Service or thinking about getting into Russian studies. 
<laughs> studying the country that you yourself have looked at so deeply for so long. What would you say to them? What's the advice? Why should they even consider the Foreign Service? And why should they think about Russia? Well, I think that the Foreign Service offers huge opportunities. Uh, one, uh, it still is a merit-based service where your advancement comes from your performance, where uh, you don't get everything you want always in terms of assignments, but every one of them is a challenge where I believe you have to have a deep-seated sense of public service uh, to commit to that kind of a situation. You live in danger. Uh, your families are not always with you. Uh, you're asked to make sacrifices for your government, sometimes uh, the most significant of those. On the other hand, uh, the notion that you can play a role in shaping for the United States, in my humble view, still the world's leading country, despite recent declines, which I hope are momentary and repairable in the next administration and believe they are, uh, that is a, an enormously gratifying proposition. And I always found that being able to help individual Americans who were in trouble was part of what my responsibilities were. And I had often uh, great satisfaction from those small cases, uh, you reuniting uh, a family around the children that may have been taken away by a divorced parent overseas uh, to being able to make a considerable suggestion for how and in what way the next phase of our relationships with a country like Russia or India or in the UN should be developed. Uh, these are enormously valuable rewards, not measured in monetary terms, but measured certainly in personal satisfaction terms. So if you are interested, don't go to the Foreign Service to believe that it's just a useful stepping stone to something higher. It may well be. On the other hand, you have to recognize that you're uh, taking away a job uh, from someone uh, who, like you, would have to learn the job from the bottom up, and you can't substitute uh, new people at mid-grade uh, for those who have learned in the field uh, and what is necessary. But I also believe, obviously, we need more education and training of our Foreign Service officers, something that currently because they are all occupied on the front lines, freeing them up to do that education and training is a problem. Uh, but none of us are working on that. But those are the things that I think people who are interested in the Foreign Service should look at. We badly need uh, people, particularly from the underrepresented communities in the United States. Uh, we do better on women, but terribly now on black Americans, less well on Hispanics, quite well on Asian Americans. But uh, we do need uh, to have that kind of participation uh, in our foreign service to represent not just the country and its many faces, uh, but to represent all the methods and, and features of thinking about our foreign relationships on the basis of your own personal history, which is something you can never discard as you become a diplomat, but you always in one way or another have to be sure is not distorting your view. Well, they have an example to follow in you, Mr. Ambassador, and thank you very much, Ambassador Thomas Pickering, both for your time and your very deep thoughts about Russia and the relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. As always, a great pleasure to join you, and thank you for the wonderful questions.